If you could remain standing, please turn your Bibles to John chapter 6. It's not a very lengthy passage this morning. John chapter 6, verse 22 through 29. And uh, we at Westminster Presbyterian Church, we read from the English Standard Version. And some Bibles uh, might be in front of you under the seats in front of you. Hear now God's holy word. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Again, thanks so much for for being here with us this morning, and we look forward to a wonderful afternoon together. Well, if you're new here, uh, we've been journeying through the Gospel of John for a little while now, and in chapter 5, just as a, a refresher, we saw what happens when Jesus is under attack, and accused of all sorts of things, um, kind of like Jesus on trial, but then how he wonderfully defends himself and his identity, both as the Son of Man and the Son of God. They're all listed there in chapter 5 that he uh, identifies himself with. Both titles pointing to the identity of being the Christ, the anointed, prophesied Messiah, our Savior, who has come. So by doing so, in chapter 5, if you remember, Jesus was equating himself to God. Not similar to God, not kind of or sort of, but he's equating himself to God. The Father and Jesus are one. Not above the Father, not more powerful than the Father, not more divine than the Father, but as God, the second person of the Trinity. And of course, the religious elites of the day, they they wouldn't have any of that kind of talk. And so they gathered together and they plotted to kill him. Then we went to chapter 6. We see Jesus continue to perform signs and miracles. Why? To validate his claims as the divinely sent one of the Father. So he performs this the greatest miracle in in regards to people. He first feeds the 5,000 multiplying miraculously enough food from just five loaves of bread and two fish to feed everyone. Everyone ate so much that they had to collect leftovers. That was the first miracle that we saw in these passages. Then his next miracle was when the disciples went ahead on a boat. If you remember several weeks ago, they crossed the Sea of Galilee. A treacherous storm arises when they're in the middle of the sea. Lo and behold... Out of nowhere, they see Jesus walking on water in the midst of a storm. And he's brought onto the boat and he directs them safely to shore. And the disciples are just simply mesmerized at miracle after miracle of this Jesus. And so for the next several passages in the the coming weeks, we're going to see the aftermath of Jesus performing the great miracle of feeding the 5,000 as his fame rises And the crowds continue to track every move Jesus might make. And then then we'll see the metaphor for the rest of chapter 6 centers around this bread and this food. But before we go into chapter 6, verse 22, let us pray for today's sermon in our hearts. Heavenly Father, would you illumine this text today by your Holy Spirit? May we not merely read it or hear it with fleshly eyes and ears. Would you open our hearts so that your word would do its marvelous work in us so that we can actually see, so that we can actually believe in this good news. 
And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of today's sermon is Food That Does Not Perish. We've all heard of food nightmares before, either personally or at big catered events or going to a food festival. We've all heard of the uh, nightmares that can come out of these things. One thing is certain, though, that we can all agree upon is that food does not last forever. We have specific expiration dates now for almost everything we eat or drink, but most of the times we know when food has not only expired, but it has rotted. I remember several years ago going to a Starbucks, not in the Elgin area, so don't worry, but my friend was getting a latte and immediately, within five minutes, he or she, I can't remember who the friend was, said, Some, oh, can you taste this? I was like, I, I don't do coffee, I don't taste. And, and, she, and she or he was saying, something is really off. And so they complained to the manager, or actually not the manager, but one of just the workers there at the front, and she looked in the fridge and looked at the, the creamer and said, oh, this is expired three months ago. And we were all like, <laughs> that happens. And it was just a mess. And I think they got another drink without that uh, creamer, of course. But things perish, even professionals like Starbucks. We think we could, they could never make any mistakes. Mistakes happen. Food and drink perish. <laughs> this past week, I, I went through a mini down the rabbit hole experience when I looked up the phrase online, catering nightmares. I kind of wish I didn't because it was, it was really gross. There's a lot of nightmares out there. One person related, <clears throat> excuse me, that her, that her wedding, she was at her honeymoon, and she found out that week on her honeymoon that 30 or 40% of their guests got sick because of food poisoning. Another wedding in Iowa was reported on their, on their nightly news, can you imagine that, that around 50 guests got sick because of the, the catered food. I've never been hospitalized for food poisoning myself, but I know that some of you here have. I heard it's one of the most brutal feelings you could ever experience. I think I'm giving you great confidence before we start eating at our cookout right after. I assure you, all our food, I was there. Uh, we were storing it in the, the, the freezer uh, this past week. There was a big storm, though, last night, so I'm not sure if the power went out, but everything is going to be fine. Amen. Let's pray hard. But you get the drift. Food ultimately perishes. There was a time-lapse video on a documentary I saw many years ago. They recorded some food items to see how they would decompose after weeks, months, or even after a year. Well, almost all the food items completely molded very quickly and almost liquefied after months had passed. The funny thing is the fast food hamburger, I won't name the brand, looked almost untouched after 12 months. It had so much preservatives in there that it looked and appeared normal. But none of us in our right mind would eat that hamburger, unless it's from Culver's, if 12 months have passed. I think most of you guys would not eat it. We would all just say, okay, that looks kind of fine, but there's no way I'm going to eat it. It's perished. In today's passage, Jesus will correct and teach the crowds that are chasing uh, after him, even pining after literal food, that there is a spiritual food that is far more important than the food that perishes here on earth. And as Jesus usually does, he uses the topic at hand, whatever they're talking about, whatever contemporary example, but here in, these, in this chapter, it's about food. He's going to use that metaphor for a deeper spiritual meaning. So please have your Bibles open. John chapter 6, we'll start again at 22. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with the disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. You see, <clears throat> when you miraculously feed at least 5,000 people, because the Bible says there were 5,000 men, so you could assume there was way more than 5,000. 
When you feed miraculously that amount of people, you better believe towns and cities, even without the internet, even without texting, word is going to be uh, spread and people are going to be alerted and everyone will soon be chasing after the central figure in that sensational story of the day. And Jesus and disciples are back in Capernaum. We shared this a couple of weeks ago. That's the headquarters of Jesus' earthly ministry. But how on earth did he get to the other side if he didn't sail with the disciples originally? Well, we know it's because of the miracle of Jesus walking on water. But the masses, the gathered crowds that are chasing him, are very confused. In verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Jesus doesn't feel the need to explain how he got to the other side so quickly. He simply, right off the bat, confronts all of them by putting the spotlight on their motives. Most of us would understand that if someone was able to give you free food out of nowhere, you'd probably want to follow him again and again, especially if you didn't have enough means to provide for yourself. But as you recall, the point of these miracles were not only for compassion, because there was compassion from Jesus when he saw the crowds, but to primarily prove and show that Jesus is the long-awaited Christ. He has come. Jesus knew they weren't coming <clears throat> to worship him for his divinity and for his ultimate mission, but they just wanted what they could get out of him materialistically. And of course, that happens all the time around the world and in America too. But it's so ironic because if they only had eyes to see and believe that this is the Son of God, the Son of Man, and if only they could put their trust in him, they would realize that Jesus could provide them with eternal provisions, not just earthly and temporal provisions. But our motives are so important, even the amount of people gathered here today or streaming online. We need to realize and recognize our motives are important to God. And so it's right that Jesus puts a spotlight on us even today. Because if our motives for Jesus are wrong, we'll be chasing after the wrong things even in our religion, what we call Christianity that will then inevitably miss the gospel entirely in, cer in certain instances. Take, for example, a missiologist professor I, I had maybe 15, 16 years ago. He talked about these boats delivering shipping containers filled with canned foods and, and new clothes and other resources to third world countries, trying to evangelize to them, to lead them to Jesus. But what happened after years of this when people would see the ships approaching, they knew what it contained. They would run out into the water to eagerly await their arrival and to cheer them on. Yes, resources have come. Now, who wouldn't want resources pouring in like that for free? It's a great work. It's a great idea. But my professor pointed out that ultimately, though, became what they associated Christianity and the gospel with, shipping containers. That was what they ultimately placed their trust in. If we just follow Jesus, shipping containers will come. The results of benevolence are not the ultimate giver, Jesus the Christ. They, they shift it, yeah, okay, I'll sign out, I'll check off anything you want, just give us the containers. And eventually what came out of a good motive to help third world countries then became the gospel itself. You can imagine Jesus saying the same thing to these people panting for the the, the containers that they, they only come to, quote-unquote, religion because of the food, not because of who was standing before them, the God-man. A PCA author, Rick Phillips, he gave another example that hits closer to home of this massively attended megachurch in the United States. And they had an idea, a marketing idea, to gather more crowds to their church. They would raffle, this one year, a wonderful, nice, new built home as a giveaway. If you just attended, you fill out a raffle ticket, you put it in the box, you go through the worship service and the motions, but you're really just hoping, hopefully we can win that new house. And guess what? It worked. Thousands from the community came, not to pursue Jesus, 
to, but to pursue this house that they were giving away. You know, I'm probably botching this quote, but some of you heard the phrase, how you attract people to come to your church will be what ultimately keeps them there. So if you're going to attract crowds based on materialistic things, that's the only way that they'll ultimately stay. Every week or month has to be something new. This bartering, this exchange, you need to keep us interested. You need to help us see that there's going to be some physical or materialistic or even worldly gain for attending your church. But if you attract people because of Jesus and what he has actually done for his people, then ultimately that's the right thing, the central thing that they'll keep coming and thirsting and hungering for. Perhaps an uh, oversimplistic way of looking at church and Christianity, but we can certainly agree that there is some wisdom in that statement about keeping people by what you first want to draw them in with Jesus. But Jesus, of course, was right. They were only clamoring after him, even going after him on boats because they wanted more of the same food and provision that perishes. But please don't misunderstand. Jesus does provide our daily bread. We even pray that in the Lord's Prayer. He is concerned about our most basic needs. But Jesus also tells us not to be anxious about food or drink or clothing, but to simply trust in him. It's not that Jesus doesn't care about these things for our needs. He does, but the priority must be seeking him and his gospel and his kingdom first. It's one of my all-time favorite comforting passages, Matthew 6, 30 to 33. You don't have to turn there, but let me just read this really quickly. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Jesus says, therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Whenever I kind of question life or even ministry or just wanting to serve the Lord or people, and I start to complain and grumble and feel sorry for myself, or that I didn't have this or that in my life, I always am encouraged when I fall upon verse 33 again, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But for the crowds in Capernaum, oh, they want the materialistic gospel, not the person and sacrificial work of Jesus the Christ. And so Jesus says in verse 27, that do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Jesus repeatedly does this. Everything is wrapped up with the identity of Jesus and what he will do. He was sent by God the Father, who has set his seal and mission on the person Jesus the Christ. For Jesus to not only live a perfect life of righteousness, never sinning even once, but to suffer at the hands of men, even die on a cross, to be then buried and then raised to life on the third day for the remission and forgiveness of sins and for the redemption of his people. This is his mission on earth. Now, Jesus, of course, is not saying earning a good wage and living so that you buy food for yourself and family, that's a wrong thing, that's a bad thing. Of course, he's not saying that. But look at that verse there in the beginning of 27. Work... It's not related to your nine to five job or child rearing or volunteering, et cetera, et cetera. Work here is related to what you pursue, what you place your trust in. So food also then should not be taken literally here. Food in this instance, the one that does not perish, is the food brought to us by God himself through Jesus in his gospel good news. You see, the gospel is what I just mentioned and what Jesus would do on earth. Something summarized in 1 Corinthians 15. If you ever want to do some more digging, if you're new here, if you want to dig into the basics of the gospel, you can read 1 Corinthians 15. It's a great summary. And so if the gospel is equated to bread here and food, that means that if you trust in Christ, the bread that is eternal will be granted unto you. 
That eternal bread leads to not a perishing, as John 3.16 famously states, but to eternal life in the presence of God in the new heavens and new earth. But look at that verse in 27 again. Notice how Jesus says, he will give it to you. You see, in Christianity, as one pastor once famously said, it's the only religion where we don't have to earn our way up to heaven or earn our way up to whatever religions call eternal life or peace. It's the only religion where God comes down to us and gives us freely this thing called salvation where we simply just have to receive the gift in faith and trust to Jesus. Many reject the gift, of course. But oh, if you only open your empty hands in faith and receive, Jesus will give you this eternal bread. But naturally, as humans often do, in one ear and out the other, we never think something is some, we never think anything is simply free. And so we ask out loud and even in our own hearts, well, how do we earn this good thing? That's what they do. Look at verse 28. Then they said to him, what must we do? What must we do to be doing the works of God? This is similar to the rich young ruler that some of you are familiar with, who despite his riches and security on earth, felt the pinch of his conscience to make sure that he would get to heaven eternal life. And in the end, after what Jesus responds to him, he couldn't fully place his trust in him. And he goes away sad because he knows that he can't duck depending and trusting in his earthly riches and resources. Because at the end of the day, in our flesh, as the Bible calls it, our sinful nature that we all have, we want to make sure we secure our own path to salvation. It bothers many of us to not trust in ourselves and our own work, but to trust in something wholly other is disturbing to us in our natural state. The phrasing there of what must we do goes back to the ultimate temptation that all of us experience to perform works righteousness. Even Christians today still struggle with this. I'll try to unpack what this phrase is all about. Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of the most gifted preachers in recent memory, a gifted Welsh preacher in the UK last century, said something like this. I'm going to paraphrase. And he wrote that if you're a Christian that, that feels terrible after committing some sin, and, and you're just wallowing in guilt and shame, and you're, why did I do this again? Am I even a Christian? I've sinned against a holy God. And he said if the temptation then that you follow through with after that is to appease that amount of guilt and shame in you, you immediately, and I think we all do this, you immediately come up with a plan to cover that sin with some good deed, some volunteering, some penance to earn your way back into God's good graces. Lloyd-Jones says that pattern is works righteousness. The ever-looping game of trying to work your way unto salvation and forgiveness. To work and pursue your way into earning the Father's love. What is so tricky about that statement is that we, these are people that love to hear the gospel receive the gift of grace freely, trust in the work of the, the finished work of Jesus on the cross, and you say amen. Then you spend the rest of your life going into this never-ending loop. Yes, at the moment of salvation, I trust in Jesus, but the rest of life, if I sin, if I mess up, if I'm not where I thought I should be, oh, I need to keep earning. I need to keep working. I need to keep proving that I'm someone that God should save. That is works righteousness. And so Jesus came to earth to say, that's completely backwards. That actually doesn't end up in eternity with Jesus, but actually everlasting hell. And you think, well, isn't hell, Robin, supposed to be for all those bad players out there? For all the people that do evil, isn't that where hell? Isn't that what hell is for? And yes, if they also do not place their trust in Jesus, they will go. But even the quote-unquote righteous, even the religious elites, 
dare I say, even the Sunday church goer, if they do not place their ultimate trust in the finished work of Jesus, you will perish and not have eternal life. We see this pattern still in our sinful selves. We, the Bible calls it the old man, our old nature that we still fight with and battle with every day. We don't get out of that rut by working harder for the love of God, but throwing ourselves deeper in the finished work of Jesus. I, again, and let me just repeat this for any of our visitors or even those who are here for 30 years, placing their full trust, all faith in the saving work of our Savior in his death on the cross and his glorious resurrection. You see, the only way we have the delight of God, the only way that we'll ever have the delight of God is by him seeing Jesus in us as our substitute. This is the only way to be saved and to be saved for eternity. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Not Jesus at the start, then Robin, you're on your own the rest of the way. But Jesus, 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 the whole journey. It's like that old chiropractor story I like to tell every once in a while. Years ago, many years ago, when hearing that I was a pastor and ready to remove my head from the rest of my body with one of his chiropractic maneuvers, he would say to me, it's a very delicate situation, his, his hands are around my neck, oh, that's great that you're a pastor. And he says something like, I always believe and tell others, just be good enough in your life and everything will end up okay. And you're saying, well, Robin, why didn't you rebuke him? And I, well, his hands are around my neck, so I'm going to wait for another day. But the temptation for works righteousness, it pervades our culture. It pervades the nations. It is our default. You know when your iPhone or whatever you use and there's a setting there that says restore to default settings. That default setting is always works righteousness. I could do it my way. I could be good enough. And if I'm not good enough, I'm going to get on a plan to be good enough in the end. And Jesus comes with a divine bat, forgive the imagery, and shatters all of that when he comes. And so the final verse, 29 Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. If you're genuinely asking crowd that has gathered, what is the work of God? Well, this is the answer. And again, this is the major theme in, John, in, in the Gospel of John. Believe. Believe the word of God and be saved. This should be great news for anyone so burdened here this morning with chasing and chasing and chasing after the wind, chasing and pursuing things that just don't ultimately satisfy. Sure, the pursuit of things of this world might temporarily scratch that itch for you or fulfill you in the short run in your mind, but for everlasting satisfaction, that only comes through believing in Jesus. And we simply move on to the next thing to fulfill that vacuum in the heart. If we don't place our trust in Jesus, it could be money, sex, sensuality, worldly pleasures, even good things that we can turn into idols, family, children, career, reputation, comfort, food, resources, a nice house, and so forth. Yes, we could place our trust rather in those things, but it never ultimately satisfies. You see, when you don't place your trust in Christ, you'll run to all sorts of vices, but, all, but also very good things in your life. But ultimately, you say under your breath at night, I still haven't found what my heart is searching for or looking for. This is why we lean on Blaise Pascal semi-annually here to summarize what's happening. That mathematician, the philosopher and the Christian famously wrote, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man, which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator, made known through Jesus Christ. Well, that leads to a pretty straightforward application, doesn't it? After hamburgers and hot dogs and playing in the water and having a lot of fun together, to go home asking yourself, am I pursuing the good food of God? Am I truly pursuing his gospel? 
Or contrary, am I pursuing the food that always perishes? I know it. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about literal boxes in your refrigerator, but you know the things that you are you know, pursuing and chasing. You, know, you can almost see the expiration date there. <laughs> if I'm honest, I, I'm kind of like that. I, I like picking up new hobbies, maybe for a month or a year, but I know there's going to be an expiration date there. I know that I can't place my joy and everlasting trust in. Said in a, from a different angle, am I going to trust in an alien righteousness? Alien simply means not from this world, but from Christ who came from heaven to save. An answer to our sin and imper imperfect pursuit of righteousness. Are you going to trust in something otherworldly? Namely, Jesus the Christ and his righteousness. Or will I try to earn my way to God's grace over and over, which ultimately ends up at a dead end every time? Sure, can I still honor God with the blessings and gifts that he has provided? Certainly. But if you trust in these things for your eternal security and satisfaction, you've missed the boat entirely. You know, this is a simple passage. This is post the miracle of the 5,000. But I think its deeper meaning is so critical to the heart, critical to the gospel, critical for you and me to understand what this is all about. And I, as I often try to say, I, I'm preaching this to my own heart and whatever traps that are there laid before me that I pursue other than Christ. So I encourage anyone here who's known me for these past several years or, or maybe this is the first time visiting with us today, you could reach out to me, you can email me, you can meet me directly after the service to talk about the matters of the heart in more detail. I'd be so privileged to help you along the way. Because we all need to be pointed to his word for the nourishing of our souls. So if you're feeling dissatisfied with the pursuit of food that perishes, don't give up. Don't give up. But seek the one who will provide you food that will never perish ever, and who will also grant you eternal life. So my charge to all of us here, including myself, is come to the bread of life, who will un unpack in the coming weeks. It's the first of the seven I am statements that we see in John, that he says, I am the bread of life. Come to the bread of life, each and every one of us. Come to this Jesus who offers this gift of salvation through faith in him and his finished work. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, would you deeply convict us? Maybe it hasn't happened this hour, but I pray that as we tuck this word in our hearts and take it home, that sometime this week, this month, this summer, you will bring this conviction that we've been chasing after such dissatisfying things. And would you compel us to repent and believe and to realize again that we are only satisfied by coming to the bread of life, the true satisfaction that comes in the gospel. Forgive us, God, for chasing after the wind, for chasing after things that will never bring us eternal security or pleasure. Forgive us, O oh God. Renew us. Help us to find joy again in gospel good news. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.